hope you've all had a great week. I just wanted to mix it up a little bit and start with one of the clips from my favorite TV shows, New Amsterdam. Has anyone in here seen it? Good, a few of you. It's awesome, right? But it is a total roller coaster of emotions because, honestly, I genuinely think I could count on one hand how many episodes I have watched and not cried. <laughs> For those of you that haven't seen it, I really think you should. It's, it's epic, apart from all the crying that you're going to do. But in the meantime, I'm going to catch you up a little bit. Obviously, the TV show is called New Amsterdam, and it's, it's set um, in New York City, and it's about the oldest public hospital that they have there. Um, and <laughs> it's actually based on a real-life hospital in New York called Bellevue, and one of its previous medical supervisors who apparently influenced a lot of the, the plot lines for the show. So the main character, Dr. Max Goodwin, who was just on this clip, that's episode one, and it's the start of his journey as New Amsterdam's newest medical director. And as you saw, he is shaking things up. <laughs> Running a public hospital, it's not an easy task. And the many that have gone before him have been quite short-lived in the role. So he's been brought on to turn the place around. The board of directors, they're expecting him to transform the hospital into a well-oiled ship that's not bleeding money. And to do that, they expect him to be sitting at his desk, wearing a suit, you know, working hard behind the scenes to enact the change that they want. But Dr. Goodwin, he's got other ideas. He's on a mission. He wants to bring real dynamic change, not to the bank balance, but to the life balance. He trained to save people, and that is his goal as medical director. You know, the current system, he sees that it's failing. He believes that patients' needs are not coming first. The financial aspect of running that hospital has taken precedent. And that's why he starts by doing something that nobody expected. He fires an entire department to radically draw attention to what should be the heart and soul of that hospital, healing people. So he arrives at the hospital on his first day, much to the surprise of all his superiors, wearing scrubs. He's ready for action on the front line. He wants to see firsthand where things need to change so that he can begin to create an environment where people actually trust in the care that they're receiving. He wants to save more lives by giving exceptional cares because he wants families to remain together with a hope and a future, not to experience the tragic, unnecessary loss that he has personally suffered. So he's positioned himself as the head of the hospital, not to meet his own needs, not to meet the needs of the board, but to meet the needs of the people in his care. There's no red tape, there's no line that he will not cross to make that happen. And he's made that abundantly clear in his first act as medical director. So although he's thrown the cat amongst the pigeons and he's agitated a ton of people, not really made many friends right there, did he? <laughs> but we see as the series unfolds that he wins over the hearts of the staff, his patients, and even his superiors, because unlike the people that have gone before him, things really do start to change, and he really is making a difference. But how does he do it? Don't panic. I'm not going to give you any spoilers. If you haven't watched it, but you should. But as you saw within that clip, he starts the process by asking one simple question. How can I help? But not just then. Not in just that moment. Max asked this question over and over and over and over and over again to every person that comes to him with the problems, and that's a lot of people. But he never tires of it. It doesn't matter whether it's his staff, whether it's his patients. If there is a problem, he is going to ask that question. It becomes his catchphrase. But in actual fact, it's so much more than just a catchphrase, because that question and his willingness to ask it is what sets him apart. His predecessors, when they were faced with the problems and challenges of running the hospital, they used their knowledge and their experience, and they provided a solution. Which really is what you'd expect, right? They provided the very best solutions 
that they could come up with. And after a short period of time, each one walked away. His PA tells him, she was the one, you know, sitting in the front row going, oh no. But she tells him that in five years, they've had five different medical directors. But they each did what they thought was best, but it didn't work. It didn't enact the change the hospital, and more importantly, the patients desperately needed, and they gave up. So in the face of problems, they were solution givers. And that seems like a great thing, doesn't it? I think the majority of us could easily fall into that category, and I actually think it's our default setting. Giving a solution to a problem seems like the best thing to do. It's a helpful thing to do. It's a natural thing to do. We see a problem, we want to help fix it because we know someone may be hurting. And our instinctive response is to try and make it better for them, to make them happier. But like Max's predecessors, sometimes we get a bit ahead of ourselves. I'm sure we've all been there. I know I have. You know, someone's pouring their heart out to you and you're, the whole time you're sitting there pondering all the different ways that that situation could be made better. And we can't wait to offer all these solutions that we've been busy thinking up so that our friend or our family member can feel better, to feel less stressed, to be happier. But we forget we're offering a solution from our own perspective. And we're all unique. We're, we all have unique ways of handling our problems. How I deal with the problem, if you were here the other week and you heard me speak, is vastly different to how Matt, my husband, would handle a problem. So my solution might work for me, but wouldn't necessarily work for him and vice versa. You know, for the last four years, I shared in, in my message the other week that Matt was in his previous job were really quite unhappy. And there were areas of conflict, um, as there is in every workplace, and that made it extremely difficult for him to navigate. And so there were things I could see that's happening. And I think it's fair to say that I would have dealt with the situation very differently. And there were plenty of times where I made suggestions about how he could handle the situation that he was in. I was frequently a solution giver because I loved him. You know, I wanted him to be happy and the sooner the better. It's really hard to watch someone that you love go through something that you have no control over. But Matt, well, he had other ideas to me, and you know, he held steadfast to what he believed was right for him. And guess what? The job he is in now is exactly where he is meant to be. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that God opened the door for him at the exact perfect time with the exact perfect people that he was meant to work with, having accomplished everything he needed to do in Matt's heart for his next chapter, for our next chapter. So my solutions would have got in the way of that happening because I was not in his situation. I didn't have experience of his problems firsthand and from his unique perspective. So I could and I should at times have had a very different approach. And that would have eased his burden. Just like it says in scripture, I needed to be quick to listen and slow to speak. I needed to, to prioritize asking the all-important question, how can I help? Because it's actually a very clever, very strategic, but very selfless question. Because although Dr. Max Goodwin had the years of experience and the accolades behind him, he could probably give a worthy solution to any one of those problems that people brought to him. But he sets all that aside because he's humble enough to realize that each person that comes to him is not only unique, but they have a better knowledge of the situation firsthand than he does. He doesn't want to be a leader that just tells people, oh, do this and fix your problems. He knows that he has to ask the right question. He knows that the best way to help people is to truly listen, to find out what they really need, even if the answer is inconvenient. Let's think about it. If Max asked, can I help? The answer would be yes or no. Essentially, he would have permission to offer his own solution, which may well help to a certain extent. But his own solution may be more convenient, may be more in line with what the board of directors would have been happy with. Can I help would keep him in control of how he helped. Can I help is, of course, a closed question. There is no opportunity to listen with a closed question. There is less risk. How can I help? It's open-ended. 
it's incredibly risky because there is absolutely no control over the possible answers that may come. It renders the asker vulnerable, but it gives the responder value. When I'm in the kitchen and I'm chopping up vegetables for dinner, Reuben, my little boy, he'll frequently come and ask, can I help? And you might think, oh, that's really nice that he would come and ask and want to be helpful. But actually, what he sees is an opportunity to play with a sharp knife. And that is what he wants to do. But in that moment, that doesn't help me at all. Because he's not going to do it as fast as I would. And I'm, 10 times out of 10, I'm working against the clock to get that dinner on the table. And I'd have to supervise him because, you know, he might stab himself or me. And with him, there's a high probability that he would do that because he's very easily distracted. I kid you not, in the, first, well, in the last six months, we, um, we went out to a restaurant and so for the first time ever, he used a steak knife. He stabbed himself in the eye. <laughs> he needed to scratch his head and he forgot that he had a knife in his hand. And then this week, when I was prepping dinner, he wanted to slice onions. And I was like, wow, that's not even a good... Why would you even ask to do that? Everyone hates that job. But I was like, no, okay. Instead, can you... Can you please dissolve this stock cube into this jug of hot water, boiling water? And obviously, the inherent risk is that he could burn himself. But I thought, you know what? He's nine. The jug is only half full. I'm sure he's going to be capable. So, you know, I start unwrapping the stock cube and he goes, oh, can I do that? So I'm like, sure, okay, yeah. And I, I moved away and then five seconds later, there was a, oh no, I've got it in my eye. And I was like, what have you got in your eye? And he said, I got the stock cube in my eye. And I'm like, who does that? And sure enough, he did have a piece of the stock cube in his eye and I then had to spend time fishing it out. <laughs> What's actually even funnier is that one of his friends has now started calling him Chicken Eye because it was the chicken stock cube. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but if Reuben would ask, how can I help? I mean, aside from falling over in shock, I could find a task for him that genuinely would help me in that moment, and it probably wouldn't be something he wanted to do. Obviously, there's a risk. <laughs> but I would feel valued and loved because he'd have listened and eased my burden in an appropriate way. He'd no longer be just a solution giver. So how can I help requires vulnerability, but it gives value. But not only does it give value, when Max asks his staff or his patients, how can I help? by asking them for the solution that they believe that could you know, help them. He's empowering them. He's giving them control of the outcome in that situation. Now, how many of us have been in situations where the help we've been given has left us feeling out of control? I used to drive an automatic Honda Jazz. I know, I'm so cool. But actually, I loved it. To me, it was like driving a go-kart. It was fun. I didn't really care what people thought about it because it was comfy. It didn't hurt my knees because the length of the seat was perfect for my short little legs. <laughs> and it got me reliably where I needed to go until it didn't. It actually started cutting out when I was driving. Like, and it would usually happen on the dual carriageway at speed. And then it wasn't so fun, and it became very, very scary. But I had to start looking for replacements. And Matt's first statement was, I am not buying you another Honda Jazz. <laughs> At that point, we'd assumed that I got on quite well driving the automatic. It was probably an automatic that I would continue with. So he was you know, researching, looking at possible choices, helping, offering suggestions. He was working out the budget. And um, one of the things that we looked at was a Mazda, like a, a little, I don't even know what model it was, but it was all right. I thought a Mazda, you know, it's not too bad. So he went and test drove it, and he was like, this is great. This is perfect for you. I think this is the one. 
And so he arranged for me to go then and test drive it. And I test drove it, and it wasn't great. <laughs> I was like, oh no. And I started to panic. I felt really powerless, and it made me feel anxious because I did need his help. But because he's more experienced in that area of life, he sort of took over control. You know, he was the one that was finding the solutions. He was, you know, looking at what was viable for the budget and what he would be prepared to buy because it made sense on paper. You know, <laughs> the budget, the Honest John reviews, they were all stacking up. But he isn't me. He has legs that are a normal length. And he doesn't have hypermobility in his joints. <laughs> it's questionable. He does have really small hands, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up kind of doing my own research quietly and, uh, and I went and I arranged for myself to go and do a couple of test drives for a couple of cars. One was, you know, a useful comparison. I thought, he can't really question this selection. And, uh, and the other one, <laughs> I thought, I suspected it would be the best car for me. And it was. And can you guess what that car was? It was a Honda Jazz. <laughs> So, <laughs> this one had a manual gearbox, though. A little bit of a step up. And it meant it became a viable option for our budget. And obviously, everybody knows the Jazz is like the most reliable car. So, I approached Matt with my personal findings. And uh, <laughs> I revealed to him. And he was absolutely dis disgusted to find out that the solution to my problem was, in fact, a Honda Jazz. So my Jazzmobile is now proudly sitting in a car park. Don't look too closely, it's not very clean. <laughs> and I don't care, I might be the only person under 60 who loves owning a Honda Jazz, but it's the one for me. And when you know, you know. So when we love the people in our lives and we want to help them as they're navigating life's problems, we need to move away from our default of giving solutions and instead show them how valued they are by starting to ask the right question, how can I help? And then we listen. We empower without judgment, without pressure, without highlighting failure. Because when people feel heard, they feel loved. In Matthew 22, verse 37, it says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So if you've been to church more than three times in your life, you've most probably heard this scripture. But what does that look like practically in our day-to-day -day life? Well, a few months ago, probably after watching the last series of New Amsterdam, I had a bit of an epiphany moment. I realized that to love God, to show God value, to empower him to do his will in my life, just like Max, I needed to humble myself and ask him the question, how can I help? Not just one time, but daily, moment by moment, problem by problem. And then I'm no longer just a solution giver, maintaining control of when and how I help. Because we need to remember, God does not need our solutions at all. He knows what he's doing. I love this. There's this uh, passage about Peter, which we're going to look at, which is from Matthew 17. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And then there appeared before them Moses, Elijah, and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love, and with him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. I love it. <laughs> There's Peter in the midst of this incredible scene before him. And somehow he finds a problem that he thinks he needs to solve. You know, he desperately wants to honor these great men. I stood before him and, I don't know, I think perhaps he was thinking, well, how long are we going to be here? Are we going to be here all night? Because if so, it's not really very good for them to be sleeping rough, these great people. So his heart's to help, but he wades in 
interrupting Jesus and offering the solution to a problem that he sees. And God cuts him off mid-sentence, and he says, listen. Because Peter was a solution giver, but God does not need us to give solutions. He needs us to give him value. And we start by asking the right question and listening. So this epiphany moment, it sort of put a few things into perspective. I started to think about, you know, how we pray and how I pray. And praying is one of the ways that we have relationship with God, right? How we spend time with him. But all too often, that time that we spend with him becomes the list of problems that we're facing. Now, the Bible does tell us to do that. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for us. But then we sort of follow it up with all our solutions, don't we? How are we going to overcome them? We're like, well, you could do this, which God doesn't need. And if that's the extent of our prayer, the extent of our dialogue with God, then it's very one-sided. If my conversation with Matt only ever consisted of me telling him my problems and how I expected him to fix them, I think he'd feel a bit boxed in, taken for granted and neglected. But we're a partnership, so he offers to help me to show me love and value, and I offer to help him to show him love and value. So it's the same with our relationship with God. The conversation needs to be two-sided for it to grow. And when we ask him, how can I help, we leave room for him to speak. So I've made a point to ask God, how can I help? And I'm learning to wait and to listen. And sometimes the answer has been maybe an attitude problem that I have <laughs> that's getting in the way of something he wants to do. Sometimes it's been sending someone flowers or words of encouragement, showering them with God's love when they're going through a difficult time. Sometimes it's making Yorkshires from scratch for my husband to show him how much he is really, really valued. This week, it's been willing to bring this message at short notice when it wasn't even fully prepared. I had a full schedule that week, this week. He, but he took care of the details, the obstacles. Because within half an hour of knowing that I would probably need to speak, all of my appointments for the week began cancelling without giving any reason at all. So that left me all the time that I needed to prepare. So when Steph told me on our school run, oh, Phil was really, really ill, he's been in bed, I could have been a solution giver. I could have hopped into my little Jasmobile and said, hey God, there's a problem. <laughs> Phil's ill. So, you know, we might not have someone to speak on Sunday. Oh, and here's a solution in case you need one. Can you make him better really quickly? And then I could have carried on with my day. <laughs> but I was willing to ask God the question and do what he needed me to do. And he made it easy for me. He took care of the details. In Matthew 6, verse 8, it says, Your father knows what you need before you ask him. He has the solutions to our problems already sorted. We don't need to worry about it. And when I ask that question and I'm obedient to carry out the things that God prompts me to do, I'm actively showing him that I love and I value him and I'm also fulfilling my God-given purpose. You know, when Max asked his staff, how can I help? He said to them, I work for you so that you can work for your patients. And God has a lot of people to save. And it says that we are called to be his hands and feet. So he needs our help. But we won't know what that help is unless we ask him. And when we fail to ask him that question day in, day out, problem to problem, we end up tiring ourselves out with unnecessary business, particularly in church. You know, we jump in thinking we are the solutions to all the problems. So without even checking what God wants us to do, we assume that it must be our purpose because it's church-related. You know, it's serving so we go wading in, and we end up in over our heads and tired on the inside, like Matt said in his message the other week. We've been so busy serving, we've spent less and less time reading, praying, worshipping, because we're offering ourselves the solutions that God may not have needed. And then what follows is complete inactivity when we become burnt out, which is no good to anyone. 
And that shouldn't be happening because it says in Scripture that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So if we're all asking that question, then there won't be people doing more than they should be and people not doing enough. So if we want to be people who are led not by the heart and all its feelings and not by the head and all its logic, but by the spirit, we have to give him value, empower him and give him control and by asking the question, how can I help? In Matthew 6, verse 33, it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. How do we seek first? By routinely, habitually asking the question, how can I help? And when we do that, we value him, we empower him, we're walking and working with him. So we have everything we need to follow his direction. We can trust that what scripture says about his yoke being light, he's never intended to wear us out. He never intends to give us things that we are not capable of doing. So we don't need to worry anymore about the solutions to our problems. He's already got them covered. So this week, are you willing to ask God, how can I help?